Welcome to today's lecture. <clears throat> um, the Baha'i Chair for World Peace is delighted to have Professor Fruma Zex uh, with us today. Um, and she will be speaking about women in conflicts, past and present, the case of Syria. So we welcome you, Professor Zax, to the University of Maryland. Uh, today's lecture is a part of our series uh, that the Baha'i Chair has on the empowerment of women in peace. The presentation will examine the situation of women in modern Syria, both past and present, and I think that's really important to have the historical context. Professor Zax will showcase the activities of women during times of conflict, and in particular, their protests during the earlier phases of the current um, civil war in Syria. I'd like to tell you a little bit about her because she's really quite a scholar uh, in, in, in Middle Eastern history. Uh, she is the chair and professor of the Department of Middle Eastern History at the University of Haifa in Israel. Uh, she is quite renowned for her work in Syria, and I would say that she's probably one of the foremost uh, authorities on this topic. Um, she, her research interests are the intellectual and cultural history of greater Syria and the formation of national and gendered identities in modern Syria. I think this is a topic that we often don't hear much about. And that's why I think her scholarship is so important to the field. She has presented her scholarship in a dozen and dozens of international conferences throughout the world, has published over 30 articles in some of the leading referee journals in the field, and she is a recipient of many scholarly awards. She has authored a book, The Making of a Syrian Identity, Intellectuals and Merchants in 19th Century Beirut. And in 2006, this book received the Best Book Award on the Middle East. She has a brand new groundbreaking book that will be released this February, and there are some flyers on the table about this. It's entitled Gendering Culture in Greater Syria, Intellectuals and Ideology in Late Ottoman Period. The book examines the Arab awakening an Arab Renaissance uh, that's referred to as the Nahada in Arabic of the late 19th century. And this was one of the most significant cultural movements in modern Arab history. By focusing on the neglected role of women in the intellectual Islamic Renaissance of the late Ottoman period, Professor Fruma Zax and her co-author Professor Sharon Halevi provide a refreshingly interdisciplinary exploration of gender and culture in the Arab world. I think it will be a very important contribution to the field because, again, we know so little about that period uh, in the Middle East. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Fruma Zax. Thank you, Hoda. You are most kind. I am delighted to be here. And I want to start my lecture with a song of, um, and to show you a young girl, I think she is probably 10 years old, who is standing on a stage uh, singing a song praising the ones who go, went against Bashar al-Assad in his regime, calling to Allah, her God, to help them to release the people from the autocratic uh, regime. So I just want to show you how children were used at the beginning of this conflict and how she was the one who had all this enthusiasm and her father is standing beside her. So just a minute.
That's all. Just a minute. I'm not going to talk about children, but children were part of what women started at the beginning of this uh, conflict. And I'm just trying to show you some of the picture of these women. This was at uh, tw 2011 and 12. You can see uh, the women up in the street with the flags. You have it all over the net. Look at shouting, calling to go against Bashar al-Assad. You see the colors, the faces. This one, they talk about uh, Asmail Assad, the wife of Bashar al-Assad, and they uh, curse her. I will talk about it. They, during the, this conflict, the, Asma was one of the most hated women in uh, Syria. You see, peace. And now I want to uh, start my uh, lecture. When I refer to women in conflict, I mean, in fact, the conflicts that women experience in society and in their inner conflicts. During the last six years, I was working with my colleague, Dr. Sharon Halevi, on a book which is going to be published in two months. It is titled Gender and Culture in Greater Syria, Intellectuals and Ideology in the Late Ottoman Period. We were overwhelmed uh, to find the advanced discourse on Arab women rights and their significant place in society during this period, which is called the Nahada, meaning Arab awakening or renaissance that took place from the mid of the 19th century until World War I. The discourse on women's rights took place especially among middle class Christian Arabs, but also among Muslims. As this period lacks primary sources on women, we focused mainly on Arab novels and Arab newspapers of this time frame. Our goal in this book was to rethink the cultural activity in Greater Syria from an interdisciplinary gendered perspective in order to provide a new vantage point when reassessing the Nahada social aspects and cultural impact. We have shown that throughout the 19th century and up to the end of First World War, there was an intense engagement with modernity and Western culture in Greater Syria. The intellectuals of the region, men and women alike, believed that it was necessary to reshape their traditional society and transform it into a more open or advanced and egalitarian one. However, this transformation was not to be a mere imitation of the West, but one in which certain selected Western ideas and institutions would be used as a tool to advance their own society. Above all, they strove to preserve their Arab heritage. We have shown that this period was both an inclusive movement, men and women, Christian, Muslim, Druze and Jews, and a comprehensive sociocultural one intent on transforming almost every aspect of people's life. From the structure of the family and the design of the home, consumer patterns and leisure practices, to the question of women's participation in social and political life and the establishment of the nation state. Not a single facet of cultural, social, economic or political life escaped the attention of the Nahada intellectuals. The book shows how Arab women in Greater Syria used this historical moment to insert themselves and their rights into the discourse of modernity. Although it is tempting to speculate on the impact of the Nahada if it could have run its course within the, an Ottoman Empire on in, or an in independent Arab state, the fact remains that it did not. It was the abrupt stop of much of the cultural and social activity associated with the Nahada, the imposition of colonial mandate rule, and more importantly, the patriarchal bargain struck between local elites and the ruling colonial 
uh, power that tainted the socio-political legacy of the Nahada. Hence, if in the Nahada it seems that women relatively advance the place in society, which grew further with the First World War that offered much opportunity for women, such as they were part of the political and national activities, philanthropic activities, and they worked outside the home. The establishment of the French mandate on Syria brought to close these developments. And this is what's important. It wasn't, you know, the bl to blame the Arab society, but really the Western one. While writing this book, the earlier, and I'm saying so-called Arab Spring, took place, and it was interesting to see the differences, but also the similarities between the discourse of women's rights and place in the Nahada of the past to that of the civil war in Syria in the present. Now, when coming back to the topic of our lecture, today, which also focus on the situation of women in modern Syria, but not in the large region of greater Syria, but in the Syrian country, modern country, I want to show the activities of Syrian women during the conflict and war, in our case, the active protest in the civil war in Syria, especially in its earlier phase, to stress what are the phases and the transformations they underwent during these four years of civil war and to enlarge how they, yet again, moved between the center and periphery of society. I would like to stress that I will not go into the discussion of the awful condition of women in the refugee camps in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and others, and the sexual violence they are subject to until this moment. While the media, both the Arab media and the international media, cover vastly the events of the Arab Spring, it deals less with the situation of Arab women. A discussion on the state of women in Syria during the civil war will contribute to our understanding of the Syrian society and will expose additional aspects of the Syrian protest. It also will present the dynamic society in which women are also taking part. It is important to note that the discussion on the protest of women in Syria is more difficult than in other Arab countries. The Syrian authorities and government are very strict and it's difficult to glean information on the state of women. We do not have many official details on women organization and the details we do have are connected to organizations that the government established. The academic research in this regard is also lacking. However, the media, especially Facebook and YouTube, Twitter is less uh, used in Syria, give us an interesting look on Syrian women's activities. Allow me to add a few more words for clarification. My lecture deals with gender cultural politics. I have two points of departure in it. The first is one of the most popular arguments in the research of gender politics, which emphasizes that in time, national crises, both internal and external to society, women turn into important partners for men in the national struggle. In these circumstances, men are interested in this cooperation, and in many cases, they present women as a symbol of their national struggle. In this way, women become active in the national struggle, and they are promised a part in the new government when it will take place. However, in reality, when the national struggle comes to its end, women are excluded from power centers, for the sake of patriarchal bargains between different elite groups of men and they are left behind or outside the political game. This is what I also term as women interplay between center and periphery. The historian Elizabeth Thompson eloquently showed this in her research on Syria and Lebanon under the French mandate. My second point of departure is that in the national struggle, 
women strive to create alternative, subversive narrative, which is different from the men's dominant uh, narrative. Before turning to the present, it is important to recall some development in the past, and I know that there are not much knowledge about this Syrian history. So, the struggle of women for political rights and their protest in the Middle East in general, and in Syria in particular, is not new. When visiting the past of Arab countries, such as Egypt, Iraq, or Lebanon, during the mandate period, we can see that women were part of the struggle against imperialism. The struggle and protest of women in Syria started already in the mid of 19th century. In this period, we see women protest following the raise of bread prices. Also during the 19th century, and with the establishment of the Arab press articles, focusing on women's rights, especially the rights for education, were written. In the period of First World War, and even before, women struggled for the independence of Syria from the Ottoman Empire. Now, I just want to show you the first picture of one of the famous um, uh, women. Just a minute. Uh, in 1920s, when the French mandate took over Greater Syria, um, women took part in the opposition. They participate both in the physical and rhetorical struggle. Women from all classes were active in the street, demonstrating and smuggling weapons, food, and medicine. An important figure was Nazik Abid by whom, here she is, who was dubbed as John the Ark of Syria and was compared to the early Muslim warrior poet Khawla bin Tel Azwar. She was active in the resistance against the French, even on the battlefield, for which King Faisal, the famed the famous Syrian uh, king awarded her army rank, this, uh, this is a uh, uniform, rank of Nakib Sharf. Another important figure was the Lebanese Ibtihaj Kedura, who called for women's rights of figures such as Julia Touma and Marie Ajami. Nevertheless, when Syria received uh, its independence, in uh, 1946, women did not become integrated in the power uh, center of the new country. In the upcoming years, there were some political activities organized by women, a few cultural salons, and women continued to fight for the right to work outside their home. Only in 1949, under the Syrian ruler Husni Zain, and not the French, remember the French ruled there for 26 years, women received their political privilege, the right to vote. In Egypt, for example, it was only in 1956. In the beginning, only women who completed six years of school could vote. Later, only women who could write and read. In 1853, women received the right to be elected, and they were not restricted as in the past. Hence, Syria was one of the first country in the Arab world to do so. Would you believe it? I would like to give some general detail on the condition of women under the Ba'ath Party, which I assume you know, the ruling uh, party in Syria since the 60s. Uh, this party called for the advancement of women in education and for their integration in the labor market. This was mainly emphasized during Hafez al-Assad regime. The Syrian constitution is considered advanced in guaranteeing, guaranteeing rights to women. For example, Article 45 in the Basque Constitution of 1973 states that the Syrian state will give every opportunity to women to be part uh, of the social and political and cultural life, and it will remove any obstacles that deprive women from becoming part of the process of building our society. And indeed, there was some increase in the percentage of women literacy. For example, 50% of the Syrian students in the 1990s were women. Syrian women were integrated in government and diplomacy offices. Women started to enter into the Syrian parliament especially from 1973, 
They held position in healthcare and education during the 1970s. And uh, they constitute only, uh, from the 7th century, they held position in healthcare and education, as I said. During the 1970s, they constitute only 2% of the parliament. And today, they constitute, especially from 2003, 12%. Meaning, 30 seats from among 250 seats of the parliament. It's not so bad. It is a high number even compared to Scandinavian countries. Nevertheless, their, their, their representation in the Syrian government is significantly low. Even though the Ba'ath Party declared its commitment to advance women, in practice, there is still discrimination against women in Syria. The Syrian constitution is considered relatively liberal, but it constitutes laws that discriminate women especially in issues such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, and children. More than that, the law doesn't give women the privilege to pass on their citizenship to their offspring. Therefore, there is no Syrian law to protect women on the basis of gender discrimination, and it is practically impossible for women to protest against this situation. In fact, the Basque Party focuses on national, no gender aspects, and in this situation, it's difficult for women to reveal their voice. This is why, as in the 19th century, I don't know what's happening with the, the, the um, uh, if I may, okay, something is moving. Literature, for example, mainly fiction, become the preferable way of women for example, authors such as Colette Khoury and Rida Sam'an to voice the critic without taking considerable risk. Recently, in 2013, I believe, a first novel on the civil war was published by the Syrian-born Kurd Maha Hassan, currently living in France, titled The Drums of Love, in which she attempts to describe current life in Syria based on uh, witness accounts. After outlining women's activity and privileges in modern Syria, I would like to move now to discussing the condition of women, in particular during the civil war, in which started in 2011. From the beginning, women took part in the Syrian protests against Bashar al-Assad and his regime. For example, in the first year of the civil war, there were 26 demonstrations of women, only women. Most of them are available on YouTube. In the beginning, we saw many women and children who protested in the streets. Some of them were holding Syrian flags, as you saw, and so on. However, as the civil war was advancing, we saw less and less women and children. And by now, we don't see them at all. So what happened? In order to answer that, I would like to describe the activities of women in the civil war and emphasize this transformation. I would like to ask some important questions and to try answering them. So why did women protest in the first place? First, by doing so, women who did not have power gained power. Second, in this way, they can express their solidarity with what is going on around them. Third, this is the way they can identify with the national struggle. It is interesting to note that it is the first time which Syrian women organize as a group against the authorities. Another question, what are the characteristics of their demonstration or in which way did they chose to do so? I am talking, of course, on the earlier days of the demonstration. First, women protested in various ways, both in passive and active methods. Second, there were gathering of men and women, what I call outside the door, in public spaces, but in other cases, men and women demonstrated separately. Third, in the beginning, women demonstrated with revealed uh, faces and later, for, from free from the Muhabarat, the secret police, 
They demonstrated with the hijab, hiding their faces, as most Syrian women did not wear the hijab in daily practice. Fourth, many demonstrations were in fact silent. This is a peaceful way to become visible, to be active in a passive way. In some uh, culture, this method is considered as a sign for uncooperation. In history, men were silent, using it as a control tool, and yet now women use silent in order to break the prevailing norms and in order to create inconvenience for the regime and men. Fifth, indoor protest, which is very noticeable in the Syrian civil war, was when women, but also men, rema remained at home and appealed uh, to others through electronic media. Some women recorded their protests, sang protest song, and so forth, and I will show you a video at the end of my lecture. When we look at the discourse of the Syrian uprising, at least in its beginning, it seems that women and men wanted to gain democratic government and to improve the socio-economic conditions. At the earlier phase of the Syrian uprising, it was not against the Alawite sect, but against the regime which they felt oppressed them. Nevertheless, in this, dis uh, in this discourse developed another subtext, the gender discourse. Educated women strove through this uprising to build for all Syrian citizens, both women and men, an unsectarian society which will be more democratic, free, and of course equal, both for men and women. At this phase, one of the Syrian women's main target of protest was the wife of the president, Asmail Assad. From a public image which was somewhat similar to that of Prince Diana, and I'm not joking, Asma became a fashion symbol and was known for her charitable activity. She became the modern version of Marie Antoinette, i.e. detached from reality and her own people. As Asma did not criticize the, the events in Syria, many women, such as Bahia Maradini, the head of the Free Syrian Union, marked her as an accomplice to the crimes. Some wish her to become the last Syrian widow. There were also voices that called to bring Bashar and Asma to international court. I would like to elaborate on a few leading women who protest strongly against the regime. Many of them started their struggle even before the civil uh, war. Suhira so Tassi, born in 1971 in Homs, became a political activist in Damascus. She studies French and education in the University of Damascus. The Atassi family was a leading family that held important political position in Syria. So here belonged to the second generation of notable families, a generation which is less religious. In this way, notable Sunni families tried and still are to restore their power. Women such as Suhir belong to the secular line, Sunni secular line, that wishes to represent the Syrian people. Many times they represent the antithesis to the conservative Sunni line that now dominates the Syrian opposition. Already from 2001, Suhir was part of what is called the Damascus Spring. She opened a blog dedicated to her father, Jamal Atassi. The later was a journalist and politician and one of the important Ba'as and Pan-Arab ideologists. He was one of the figures who helped in writing the Ba'as constitution. In 1970, he supported the regime of Hafez al-Assad but later, he turned against him and Hafez al-Assad removed him from the Ba'ath party. Suhir herself was arrested in 2001 by the Syrian regime and her blog was closed until 2009. From this year, she tried to create silent demonstration and strove to achieve a Syrian democracy. Um, the Mukhabarat, uh, the secret police, persecuted her and arrested her for her 
appearances and interviews in Al Jazeera. Uh, finally, she went underground and later escaped to France. From there, she continued her struggle. So here called for political reforms and civil rights. She documented the tortures of the population and the inhuman events of the civil war and updates international groups. In 2011, she established the Committee of the General Revolution, which included 40 revolutionary groups. She represents this committee abroad, and it's trying to create an international coalition to remove Assad's regime. In December 2013, Atassi resigned as a vice president of the exiled national coalition after a corruption scandal involving aid funds. She said she would keep her position as a chairwoman for the opposition aid agency uh, and the assistant coordination unit based in Turkey. Another example is uh, Rassan Zaytun. Um, as with Atassi, she began her activity before the civil war. She is a Christian and was born in 1977. She is a human rights activist and a lawyer. She published detailed description regarding the violation of uh, human rights in Syria. From 2001, she, is, she and other Syrian lawyers organized a society to defend political prisoners. In the same year, uh, they uh, established the Syrian Society for Human Rights. Zaytun won a prize from the European Union for her activities but was accused by the Syrian government as a foreign agent and went underground. Her husband was arrested and was tortured. Subsequently, she was kidnapped on December 2013, and there is not much detail about her since. Zaytun stands for a peaceful, democratic, united Syria one that transcends sectarian and religious identity and establishes the rule of law and rights for all. The third figure is the Alawit, and she is an Alawit woman, Fadwa Sliman, and I will give you uh, her, uh, her uh, video um, in the, in my end, at the end of my lecture, who is a famous actor in Syria. She was born in Aleppo, and spoke against Assad as an Alawite and uh, his regime calling for a free and democratic society. She went on a hunger strike and cut her hair. Then she escaped to France, still calling to abolish Assad regime. She explained that she opposed the regime also in order to show that not all the Alawites are educators of Assad. In addition, she emphasized that she opposes Muslim extremists and terrorists. So what are these women trying to accomplish? The main purpose of these women in the beginning of the civil war was to reform society and to change its priorities. They believed that women could be noticeable through their national struggle. They saw the struggle as an opportunity to be part of the national discourse and an opportunity to expose and document the way they see the national struggle. Women in this way define the meaning of what is a political struggle, who is a national hero, and who should become part of the national narrative. They promote this idea both through the electronic and non-electronic media. How do they create their alternative discourse? All the women I present saw the uprising also as a female uprising. Let me tell you about another few examples. Rima Farhan, a political Druze activist, she saw the struggle, at least in its beginning, as an authentic one that will bring true change in women's conditions. She believed that at the end of the struggle, women will gain equality and democratic rights. Khawla El Dunya uh, is another example. She is very liberal and democratic in her approach. She described the revolution in Syria as a female revolution, El Saura, El Suria, El Unsa, she said. In her opinion, only peaceful struggle will bring a solution, and only in this way 
can women be integrated into society? Samar Yazbak is another example, an Alawit, again, journalist and writer, but removed herself from her ethnic group. She wrote novels and short story, but also uh, books on the condition of women in Syria. In her mind, the main cause for the revolution was hunger and humiliation. She also claimed that it should be an unviolent struggle, but at the same time, she emphasized that the government deprives the population from using this method due to its aggressiveness. Eventually, she also escaped to Paris. In 2011, she wrote the book, A Women in the Crossfire, Diaries of the Syrian Revolution. The book, which is written as a diary, described the horrors of the regime. She also established an organization titled Syrian Women for the Development of Humanity. The organization documents the crimes of the government and uh, supports economic projects during the struggle. This optimistic feeling and attitude of women dominated at the beginning of the uprising. It changed when the uprising turned into a civil and sectarian war, and of course, when many militant and terror groups became the dominant voice of the opposition. In this way, women were pushed from the center of the struggle to its periphery, and it became rare to see them demonstrating in the streets. In fact, when the conflict intensified and changed, women's role changed as well, both for those who remained inside Syria and those who, left, who had left. Now, women are focusing more on humanitarian aid, psychological and social support for women and children, media and medical help. In fact, the majority of women leaders are now leaders of humanitarian aid. Nevertheless, I would like to show another aspect of this women narrative. As the struggle became violent, women became active in the Free Syrian Army. Some came from outside Syria, such as the famous Canadian Kanafani. The Free Syrian Army included women division. Most of the soldiers collected information, helped refugees, and wounded. To conclude, from the initial, initial uprising against the government of Bashar al-Assad in the spring of 2011, women in Syria have organized and participated in peaceful demonstration and provided vital humanitarian assistance to those in need. Like their male counterparts, Syrian women who took part in protests or provided aid are targeted for abuse, harassment, and even torture by government forces as well as by some armed group opposed to the government. Many women have become de facto household heads, both inside Syria and in the um, refugee setting, when male families uh, members have been killed, detained, forcibly disappeared, injured, disabled, or unable to find steady employment. Um, Recognizing women multiple and significant roles and their experience as both participants and victims is critical. It is also important to ensuring their ongoing and meaningful participation in determining Syria's future. I would like to end my lecture with few remarks. First, it is difficult to determine a paradigm that will describe women's behavior in conflicts. The responses of women to the Syrian uprising are indeed pluralistic. The path of the Syrian women to equality is stretched, but as long as the violent struggle continues, women will probably not take part in it. Third, it is obvious that women in Syria create, through the Syrian uprising, a discourse of their own. So it is reasonable to think that even though in the beginning of the uprising, women took part in the national struggle, when the uprising will approach its end, women will probably be left outside the national discourse. Today, the situation of Syrian women has changed from revolution to survival. And now I'm ending my lecture, but I want to show you um, 
uh, short video um, escape here, but it's not just a minute. خميس الاضراب العام في مدينة حمص تتم مداهمة الأحياء في حمص منذ البارحة بحث العلم ويتم ضرب الناس للاعتراف عن مكان تواجد في حال تم اعتقال من قبل الأجهزة الأمنية أو قوى الجيش هناك احتمال أن يجبروني للخروج على قناة الدنيا للاعتراف بأني متآمرة على سوريا كما فعلوا مع الشيخ الشريف البطل أحمد الصياصني والضابط البطل حسين هرموش وفي حال تم إيذائي أو إذا أي فرد من أفراد عائلتي وبأي شكل من الأشكال فأنا أحمل النظام وأجهزته الأمنية والشبيحة المسؤولية الكاملة عن ذلك وأعلن أنني سأستمر في التظاهر والإضراب عن الطعام الذي بدأته أول أمس لكسر الحصار عن أحياء حمص المحاصرة ولأثبت لكل شركائنا في الوطن كذب النظام وادعائه بوجود عصابات مسلحة وسلفيين وإسلاميين متطرفين يريدون قلب الحكم وإبادة الأقليات وأوصي الشعب السوري العظيم بأن يستمر بنضاله السلمي حتى إسقاط النظام وتحقيق الدولة المدنية الديمقراطية التي يحلم بها كل السوريين وأدعوكم لتوحيد الصف والوقوف معا لإسقاط النظام الفاقد للشرعية منذ اللحظة التي عدل بها الدستور ليناسب استلام بشار الأسد الحكم في سوريا لا لشيء إلا لأنه ابن الرئيس السابق وأناشدكم اليوم وكل يوم لنزول إلى الشوارع والساحات معلنين العصيان المدني والإضراب عن الطعام حتى سحب قوى الجيش والأمن من المدن والشوارع المنطفضة والإفراج عن كل المعتقلين السياسيين ومعتقلين الرأي في سجون القمع ولحق دماء السوريين كافة وأناشد كل السوريين الشرفاء في العالم وأناشد كل إنسان أينما كان لمساندتنا والوقوف أمام سفاراتنا في العالم معلنين الأضراب عن الطعام تضامنا مع حق الشعوب في التعبير عن رأيها في أنظمتها دون أن يكون لهذه الأنظمة الحق في سلبها حياتها يا أحرار دمشق يا أحرار برزة والقابون والميدان يا أحرار دوما والقدم ودارية والمعظمية وحرستة وزملكة واربين يا أحرار المليحة وركن الدين والزبدان يا أحرار درع يا أحرار بانياس واللاذقية وترتوس يا أحرار حما وحلب وإدلب والبوكمال وذي الزور والرقة والقامشل والحسكة أدعوكم جميعا للإعلان عن العصيان المدني والإضراب عن الطعام في كل الساحات وكل الشوارع تضامنا مع سجناء السجن المركزي في حمص المضربين عن الطعام ولفك الحصار عن باب عمر المحاصرة منذ أكثر من أسبوع والتي تتعرض للقصف المتواصل بالمدفعية وبالرشاشات والتي عزلت عن العالم ولا أحد يعلم ماذا يحدث في بابا عمر بابا عمر تتعرض لكارثة إنسانية حقيقية قفوا معها لأن أي حي أو شارع أو مدينة في سوريا ليسوا بمنأى ما يحدث في بابا عمر ما دامت الجامعة العربية تعطي المهلة والأخرى للنظام للاستمرار في قمع الشعب السوري وسلبه حريته وكرامته وحياته والسلام كل السلام على سوريا وشعبها والسلام كل السلام على سوريا وشعبها والسلام كل السلام على سوريا وشعبها خميس الاضراب العام في مدينة حس 10 11 2011 That's all